really quick 30-minute webinar, hopefully valuable for you, on the top 10 considerations when planning a content migration project. Keep in mind that you may ask questions in the question box throughout the webinar that we will answer at the end. And you can also maximize your screen with the button in the upper right-hand corner. And without further ado, I will hand it over to our subject matter expert on migration, VP of Consulting at Integra, Jason Brandis. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us and spending your time with us today. Um, again, the goal here is to give a kind of a brief overview of what is involved in different migrations. Uh, to give a, a very quick background on Integro, uh, we are information lifecycle governance experts. Uh, we've been in business for the last 20 years, and <clears throat> I myself have more than 14 years experience in information lifecycle governance and e-discovery. Um, you know, some of the things that you're seeing on the screen is, you know, we won IBM Worldwide Governance Excellence Award, and we're also listed this year in the Gartner Cool Vendor. Uh, one of the other things that we're very proud of is, in fact, this uh, clutch rating, which gives us the top ECM consultants. As you can see, we're in the upper right-hand corner. And this was really important to us because it wasn't just based upon questionnaires that were sent to us, but actually questioning our clients and the responses they gave back about us. So again, when we talk about what are some of the key considerations for migration, you need to kind of think about what the migration you're going to be doing. We're going to talk about some different ones here in the next half hour. Uh, first one, of course, is an EMC or a repository migration, whether you're moving from a legacy system to the same system that's been updated but on new hardware, um, or you're actually switching platforms due to support or political changes that have happened with inside of your company. The next one, of course, is an email migration. Um, these are very common, especially right now, where we're moving from one platform to another. We might be you know, um, just upgrading um, where we had a, a archive solution, but we're going to be moving it to either a different um, system, whether we're moving to Domino or Exchange or even to a cloud-based solution. And the last one we're going to talk about is kind of an Office 365 or a cloud migration. These are, again, very popular right now. Uh, where we're taking from our current system whatever you might have as an email solution on premises and moving it off to an Office 365 solution. Um, I'll kind of talk about intermittently throughout the presentation today about each one where they kind of make sense. And of course, toward the end, I'll be focusing more just on the email migration. So some of these are not. I mean, we're talking about our top 10. Some of these are not going to be a surprise, and, but you just really can't leave them out. And that first one is, is planning. Um, I hope you know, some of this is going to be pretty self-explanatory when we talk about our core considerations. You know, where is our source? How are we going to do the migration? Where is going to be our target? Um, and I'll talk about those in each a little more detail as this goes along. But some of the other things that are a little more interesting to talk about is dependent applications. So when we talk about dependent applications, it's both ways. A lot of times we just think about external links to this system, right? So we're talking about things that might be looking up into your email or to your, uh, your repository, you know, if you have FileNet or OpenText or Documentum. What's looking into that? What, what are we need, going to need to redo? But there's also sort of the flip side where we're talking about links to external applications. And when we talk about external applications that a lot of times these legacy uh, systems have been designed so long ago, many of the people who originally did it aren't there anymore. So there might be a lot of workflows that you have built in that are looking into legacy systems, SAP systems, other databases that we don't know about anymore. It really is important to do kind of a census of everything that's going to be going into this. In addition, one of the other key aspects that we're looking at is, let's say you're doing a domino migration where we have significant amount of integration with workflow and things like that that might have to be rebuilt in the new system. In addition to that, hopefully, again, another pretty straightforward one is reporting. Uh, you know, a lot of times we have clients, you know, just move me as fast as I can. But in the end, reporting is very, very important to your planning. How much am I moving? What am I moving? What do I have in my source? And what should I have in my repository? It seems very straightforward. But in case, in this case, it can be very complicated. And especially when we're talking about repositories, they're doing single instance storage, where in fact, a, a single email that was in 10 people's mailboxes might only be stored once in the repository. But when it gets restored and goes through a migration, 
you actually have to count for that five times because it's going to go back into five people's mailboxes. Priority, I can't tell you how many times we get this and when people will just talk to us and say, as fast as you can go, I want to get it done, I want it all done, and it has to be done by July of this year. There's no way we can't do it. There's a limitation, of course, of what, and we're going to talk about this in great detail of all these systems, the source, the migration, and the target. You really need to focus on what your key priority is right now. We have a lot of clients, not just one. Almost every client we're talking to right now that's looking at a migration for a legacy system, one of their biggest priorities is to get it off of Windows 2003 server. It's end-of-life support this summer, unless you want to pay a significant amount to Microsoft for extended support. So again, there's priorities, and you need to determine what's really important and when it has to be. Getting everything instantaneously, you're going to find very quickly, is probably not going to happen. And the last thing is support. We talk a lot about support in this, where we're talking about different types of support. So it's not only support for the new application and for the migration, but also for your legacy system. And we'll talk about this. A lot of these legacy systems have suffered kind of an atrophy. They've been working for a long time. Nobody touches them. But we're going to put a lot of volume through them. So they're going to need support on every single phase of this. Another thing that's a key consideration is do we really need to migrate everything? And that cleaning up is one of the key factors of what we're going to do. The example always is given on these migrations is, is you have your garage. It is chock full of stuff that you've had. You're going to move to a new house. Do you really want to just pack up all of your garbage that's in your garage right now and just move it and have boxes and boxes full of garbage in your new garage? Probably not. You know, again, many times we have clients who say, hey, move everything. I don't want to think about it. While not thinking about it might be the easiest decision, it can really make it more expensive and a more complicated process. So it is worth the time and the effort to try to put into, into consideration some selection criteria that we might be able to use. That might be as simple as, you know, we're not going to move anything that's over 10 years old. We're not going to move, uh, if we're doing an email migration, we're not going to move the email for users that are no longer in the company. Something simple as that. It can also get more advanced, like if we're looking at full text. Uh, we've done migrations in the recent history where we've had some failed record solutions in which end users have taken all of their email. They had a policy in which after 90 days it was deleted unless it was categorized and put into a record category. So what we found was abuse of that system. It's a failed implementation where everybody just dragged all of their email into accounting because it was the first one on the list that showed up for that record category. And that's not really effective, just to say, hey, we're going to take everything and move it over to accounting. In that case, we actually might have to do some full text. In fact, in this environment, we did, trying to figure out what's in there and see if we can actually sort it. It is also the time when you're doing these large migrations, if we can, if you already have a file plan or a retention policy, it might be a great time to start enforcing that and talking to the owners of the data and say, can we get rid of this? Can we actually implement the file plan that's out there? So another consideration, of course, is resources. And we'll talk about each one of these in more detail. So it's people. Again, people are probably the, the resource um, that we need the most. And again, we're going to need them at every single phase, both the legacy. So on your, ex, your legacy system, again, we're going to be putting a lot of volume through this system that hasn't seen volume maybe in years. It may just be in, a, in a, almost a steady state where you're not ingesting anything new. And you're going to have to be able to support that. You're going to have people doing your migration, whether you use outside consultants or you're going to be using your own in-house, or you're going to hire an outside contractor to help you out with this. Tools. You know, I get asked almost every migration, what is the best tool? And there's no best tool. It really does depend on what you're looking at. I mean, there are tools that will move your data very, very quickly. There are others where you say, well, that's great, but I actually need to do translation. I'm going from I'm going from a doc class, or I'm going from this archive solution, and I need to modify my metadata during the process. And again, the tools that usually go the fastest are not the tools that do have some of these more advanced um, features where you can do data translation and things of that way. The other thing is cheapest is not always the best. 
Sometimes it is. If you're a small company and you're looking at a very cost-effective solution, you might be very price sensitive. But in many cases, what we're looking at is the best fit. And that's really where consulting is going to come in to say, for what you're going to do, if I'm moving two terabytes of data, it is, might be a completely different tool set that we're using if I'm migrating 240 terabytes or petabyte of information. Um, and then again, of course, the target again. When we're going to the target, it's important, and we're going to mention this in greater detail, is the performance. The performance of the target, I can't tell you how many times we've gone to clients that says, oh, no, our system is great. Just recently, we went to one and they had, it's working great. It is absolutely working perfectly for their daily volume. But you have to realize, as a good rule of thumb, in a migration, we're going to move from the legacy system one week of data every day. So in this case, when we looked at it, we said, you know, your utilization is sitting at 70%. If I put seven more days in that same day, you're not going to be able to complete it. So what you need to do is not just look at the performance, but do you have enough storage if you look at your entire legacy system to put on the new? And then the last one, of course, is indexing. A lot of times what you're saying is, I can move it over there, but how quickly can I index it? Because again, indexing is a very process-intensive operation. So if you need to be able to do immediate e-discovery on this or be able to search it for some type of compliance, you need to take that into account that we're going to be putting seven times your additional daily load on your production system in order to meet it. And can your indexing keep up? Or will there be a lag time? And that just needs to be recognized. You know, and again to that, we're going to add some network considerations. Um, we talk to them, and most time, most companies' backbones will handle a given migration. The, my, the backbone itself doesn't tend to be the problem. The problem is the issues at the servers. The issues is bolt into the servers. So again, we have a legacy system. We might be sitting on a system that's running on six, seven, ten-year-old hardware, where we have ten megabit NIC cards, very slow NIC cards, and we're going again trying to be pushing hundreds of thousands of documents through that a day. And then, then just the reverse on the other side is when we're looking at the production system, many of these production systems are able to handle the load and maybe even double the load. But are they able to handle seven times the load actually at the NIC card level? So it's very important that you look at what the performance is, especially on your legacy servers for your network. There's also WAN options. A lot of times we have clients that might have data centers in New York and they're looking for a more cost-effective solution and they're going to move their data center down to North Carolina. And in this case, what's really helpful is there's a couple ways of doing that when we're doing it. Most clients will not allow us to do the migration over their WAN. It's too intensive. It takes too much of a bandwidth. Sometimes nighttime is not an option either because then we're doing backups and things of that nature where the WAN is also very busy. So that leaves us a couple different options, which is we might be able to do drive shipping or storage clusters. Drive shipping is pretty safe. Storage clusters are really um, your, your isolons, your net apps, these type of devices that will actually do a very consolidated and compressed synchronization between the two data centers. And that again is a very optimal way of actually doing and getting that data from one location to the other. One of the things we require, and if you are looking at any consultant, you should also look at requiring this also as a health check and a speed performance. I can't tell you how many times we've gone into clients and their first word out of their mouth is, how long is it going to take? How long is it going to take? How many documents can I do in a second, in a day, in a, in a week period? How long is this migration going to take me? And the problem is, is anything, until they come in and do a health check or look at your system, is just a promise, backed by nothing, unless you can promise them a guarantee on the speed. And the health check is not just the migration utility. They can give you spouts and they can say, oh, we were able to migrate five terabytes in a day. And what type of system? In a test system that's running on, on, on a... On a AIX system, high-end Unix platform with solid state drives, 
it really does depend on yours. And a health check is on both sides. As I mentioned before, when we're looking at a legacy system, you have to make sure that everything is working. Most legacy systems are in a state of somewhat of disrepair. Again, we have systems that might be sitting out there for years that aren't actively uh, being used anymore or only being used minimally. And we're going to put them into full production, if not more, you know, four or five times, six times the load they were ever originally designed for. And again, this is usually on old hardware, old drives, and you're trying to push that as hard as you can. And again, as I just mentioned, on the target side, you're looking at some of the exact same things. You're looking at a volume where typically companies are not way oversizing their hardware. Hardware, while well, it's not outrageous, is not free. And again, when we're looking at things that might be on VMware environments or on fixed environments, you really need to look at that target environment and make sure that it is ready also. And again, last thing is references. When I talk about references, I get a lot of, of different things. You know, people, I want my exact industry. I'm not sure that references for your exact industry are important. I think for your style, if you're doing uh, a certain, you know, migration from one EMC platform to another, they've done that before. If we're doing an email migration, have you done it with this type of archive? Have you done something that's two terabytes to 240 terabytes? You know, see, these are some of the things that Integra has done. I'm not sure on an email environment if it matters that if you're in banking or if you're in healthcare, but that size does matter. There are different issues that arise if you're only doing small migrations or if you're doing very, very large ones. Storage and growing pains, um, you know, I, when we go through these applications, in many cases, what we have found is we have to have some type of temporary storage when we're migrating. Um, and this is because of a numerous number of issues that you can move them off. We can move them off to your SAN array. We can move them off to USB 3 drives. But again, a lot of times when we work with some very, we've worked with some very large banks where they go, oh, well, it won't take that long. We'll be able to ingest it very, very quickly. And sometimes things don't always turn out as you plan. You need to make sure that you have enough storage to maintain you think what you think is the worst case scenario for moving it over. In some cases, they said, oh, we can get it over in three days. Some it's seven. In others, we've been six months ahead. We've actually migrated it where a different company was doing the ingestion. We migrated it, and we were six months ahead of the actual migration. And this was because of the second one, growing pain. A lot of times when we're looking at old systems, again, these old systems grew organically. They knew how to handle the volume because they went through the growing pains themselves. A lot of times if we're standing up new systems and moving all of our data from our legacy system to our new system, you're putting years worth of data in months worth of time onto this new system. You should expect growing pains. I have never been to a client that said, oh, going, let's say, from Domino, where we thought Exchange would be so much better. But when we take all of that data, years and years of data that's been sitting out there, you're going to have to expect some growing pains. You're going to have some hardware pain, storage, um, indexing. You're going to run into issues that you, you ran into over years of your legacy system, and they're going to be compressed into a very short period of time on your new system. So email migrations, I'm, I'm going to do a little more focus on that. Um, so on email migrations, what we see is a lot of domino and exchange migrations. Again, as you saw from the beginning, we are a premier IBM partner. We're also a Microsoft partner. And what we do is we've actually developed a very specific utility for one of these use cases, which is an email migration if you're on domino or exchange and using Common Store or IBM Content Collector. Um, We've done a lot of these globally. In fact, um, when you search for it, there's not a lot of utilities that are still doing Common Store. Common Store has been out of support now for a few years. We still get calls. We get calls from China, the Middle East, Asia, um, uh, other parts of Asia and Europe about doing some of these migrations because there's not a lot of people that can't possibly do this type of migration. Integro has actually built a product called e Integro Email Migration Assistant, which we call IEMA. And one of the key benefits is the fact that it can improve the performance of a migration tenfold over a manual or included uh, migration in those products. And one of the key benefits that it does is it can restore all email in the mailbox or journal with or without a stub. So if you're familiar at all with Common Store, 
there's the ability to have a stub in the email. And if an end user deletes that, for some of the utilities, they have nothing. This utility actually goes into the repository, whether it be Content Manager or FileNet, and actually determines by mailbox what emails is out there and restores those. Again, to, another thing that it also do that the key performance in this, above performance, sorry, is the fact that it will actually keep track of what it's done and does full reporting on it. So we understand that if we're going into John Doe's email, that he should have 50,000 stubs in there and that 10,000 of those are in the mailbox, 40,000 were deleted, and keep an audit trail of every single email that's coming back. So again, that's a key differentiator. If you're looking at doing a uh, domino or exchange migration, if you're using Common Store or IBM Content Collector. So of course now, um, one of the hot topics is of course cloud migrations. I'm only going to talk about the biggest one right now that we're seeing the most, which is coming from a Domino Exchange environment and going to Office 365. Um, <clears throat> Microsoft is probably typically going to do your onboarding uh, for 45 days. Uh, you might imagine 45 days is not a lot of data. Um, in most cases, it's not enough. And so we're, when you talk about this and this onboarding, what are you going to be doing? Um, when you talk about working with a client that's done onboarding, you should always ask for references. Because the space is very, very active, you need to talk to somebody who's had a lot of references in onboarding and working with Microsoft and working with the different mail platforms. If they only know Microsoft and you're a legacy Domino shop, it doesn't help you as much. They need to know both Domino and Exchange or Office 365. If you are Make sure you just get the references. Again, when we talk about this, you talk about volume. If you're already comfortable with Exchange, you know the throttling policies. And Office 365 has those same policies. Even if you're using 30 or 40 service accounts to move over data, it's still a slow process on onboarding. So when we talk about onboarding, and you talk about what about the other years of my data, I just don't want to move 45 or 90 days of my data. How am I going to get the rest out of there? And of course, there's a lot of different ways to do it <clears throat> for your legacy data. When we talk about it, you can go direct. As I just mentioned, when we go direct, you might be looking at some throttling policies that are going to affect you. Microsoft doesn't want everybody just hitting all their servers as fast as they want. That would bring their system down. So they really have implemented a very tight throttling policy to limit how much you can move. Other ways that are doing it, you know, that Microsoft is allowing it, and again, with different utilities, we can talk about drive shipping. There's a legacy drive shipping. There's also a new system that's coming out that allows you to use four terabyte SAS drives with BitLocker on them to move them over very quickly. This is a great way of doing it. It's a little slower than the current method. The, the new method with the four terabyte um, SAS drives will be a quicker method because um, Microsoft's going to move it right into the array and move it on. But right now, the, probably the fastest way that we're seeing and is using Azure drives or Azure servers. And surprise, an Azure server is sitting on Microsoft Backbone. It's a server that they will lease you month to month for doing these migrations. And the easiest way to do that is usually as you're migrating it off, as you're pulling it out of your legacy system, whatever it is, you can do an SFTP transfer over um, to these Azure servers, and because that's already on the Microsoft backbone, it moves it into that system very, very quickly, and it ignores the throttling policy that Microsoft has been put in place. You know, as we, during the migration is, you know, what are we going to talk about uh, during these migrations? And of course, it's not instantaneous. Um, you know, while you might get your data over pretty quickly, your first bit of data, your 45 or 90 days over to the system during an email migration, the rest of it is going to take a while. Um, there's a lot of pretty straightforward options. You know, you can provide access to your legacy system. You can have them keep local PSTs if that's allowed. If you're on a, an, a Domino-based platform, we can allow iNotes or have them keep the um, <clears throat> keep a client actually still on their desktop until that migration is completed. So again, those are all pretty straightforward. What we find the key thing that we've been finding that's causing issues with this migration is the fact of resources. So I mentioned resources a couple times. There are, there are the human resources are probably the ones that are the most affected and most likely to leave. Just recently, I had a client in this quarter, uh, last quarter, Q1 of this year, 
where they go through the migration. They were moving on, off to Office 365. They had 12 exchange administrators, all of them quit, because they knew as soon as they went to Office 365, they weren't in a job. They, in fact, toward the end, decided, oh my gosh, we're going to lose all of our exchange administrators, and they had to pay to keep another person in place. This is true regardless of the migration for the legacy system, whether you're on OpenText, Documentum, even Content Manager or FileNet. If you're moving to a platform that's not the same, and you haven't often and <clears throat> directly interacted with those people that are supporting your legacy system, they might leave well before the migration is over leaving you with little to no support or having to go out to uh, consultants to support it. While most consultants are happy to do that, it's important to know that that's going to cost you more money when you're talking about supporting a legacy system that may not be there. And again, this is also true with Domino. If you're going from a Domino to an exchange on or off-prem solution, you need to make sure that you don't just lose all your Domino people because many times they'll just leave if they're not getting offered for retraining or reassignment. So again, this is one of the key considerations that you need to consider as you're going through a migration, is if you're leaving a legacy platform and you're going, let's say, off of a certain system, these people are not incented to stay, and you need to address that before you start that migration. So again, kind of going through this, just to kind of give you a quick list of what we talked about. We talked about planning. What's going to go in? What should go in up front? before you even start a migration. Cleanup, the concept that if we can get rid of something before we have to migrate it, that's so much infinitely faster. Resources, again, probably the key consideration, whether it be your legacy system or your new system, support for that and understanding what hardware and infrastructure is available to support the entire process. In most cases, the migration is usually the least effective. Usually consultants are helping you run that. It's usually on newer hardware. And in most cases, almost all tools allow you to scale up by adding more servers. Network considerations. Again, where is this data going? How am I going to get it there? And again, what my hardware looks like. Health check and speeds. Everybody's first question is going to be, how fast can it go? That really is going to depend on your system. So if somebody doesn't come in and check your system, they're really not going to know how fast it is. And anything they're going to tell you is it's just a, a finger in the wind, taking a guess, trying to get the sale. Last one, of course, is uh, not last. Storage is very important. These migrations always have some type of hiccup or moving, and you're going to have to have ample storage in order to store this and keep going ahead. Whether it be, like I talked about during the actual migration, or the fact that we might have to turn archiving off on a legacy email system, so it's going to be growing while you're actually doing the migration. You have to plan for that type of storage. Domino, again, we talked about the IMA product that allows for a very fast migration off of Common Store and ICC for Exchange or Domino. Microsoft onboarding, what might be included, and then, of course, all of your legacy data in your interim solution, which would include, of course, keeping all those resources you need during the migration. I know this is a very high level, and it's very much a very quick overview of what we have out there. Uh, as for next steps, Integra would be happy if you're looking at a common store or an ICC migration, whether you're going from one platform to the next or just upgrading it, um, to give you a demo of the Integra email migration assistant. Or, of course, we can give you access to other, some other case studies that we've done for other clients to give you an idea of what you might be doing. And of course, we'd be happy to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, giving you detailed information about the specific migration needs for your company. Uh, and you, of course, can contact Kristen Dorr uh, or myself directly uh, if you would like any of these above. So Kristen, were there, I know we're running kind of out of the end of time. Were there any questions that were posed during the webinar that I might be able yeah. to add in our last couple of minutes? Yeah, we have a few. The first question. When planning an ICC or common store migration with IMA, what is the ballpark performance that you can expect? So, and I just said I can't quote it without getting on your side. So here we go. We'll, we'll take a, a finger in the wind. Um, typically, it's going to be really based upon your legacy system and your target system will handle it. This is not always the case. But in a Windows-based environment, so if you are running on a Windows, you're probably going to look at somewhere between 100 to 400,000 documents per day 
is what we can safely move. And a day varies greatly. I didn't talk about it. There's a lot of ways you can run this. You know, there's a normal contractor that's only going to run it from 8 to 5. You can push higher volumes if you do a 24-7 migration. But again, that means you're going to have to have at least two people to run that so they can be checking it throughout the night and keeping the process going. Flip it. Uh, I have comfortably done um, migrations that are based on a Unix-based platform on AIX uh, where we're pushing you know, 800,000 plus documents per day. So that's kind of a, a good thumb um, representation of what we might have out there. Awesome. Second question. You said health checks were important. Do we have to sign up for an entire migration to do a health check, or can we just get the health check? No, actually, you know, as a project, um, that's typically what we do. Because again, a lot of times our um, companies haven't heard about us, uh, and so it allows Integra will absolutely do a health check all by itself, whether you use us or not. We'll go in, we'll review your system, and plan ahead, and actually give you a roadmap ahead. Uh, in most cases, of course, or you know, once you've worked with us, we believe like the clutch rating that you will find us very effective and very professional. Uh, and we've done it before. We have references for clients that are have done over 240 terabyte migrations up to the very small ones, you know, from legacy um, FileNet systems to newer, you know, FileNet. Uh, but we can absolutely just do a uh, health check for you, give you an estimate, and then let you decide uh, from there what you'd like to do. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, Jason, and presenting on migrations. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. We don't have any further questions at this time, so we will sign off. Thank you, everyone, for your time.